I can start us off with an anecdote if you guys want. Yeah. Do you, want, do you guys want to hear an anecdote? I would love to hear an anecdote. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I, yesterday I applied for a job. I went down to the interview. Uh, I brought with me uh, my trusty tote bag. And last night I got a call from the guy who interviewed me uh, for this cafe job. And he was like, yeah, just um, just a couple things. Uh were you wearing um, a Marks tote bag yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, okay, okay. Maybe don't wear that. <laughs> like, I don't have a dress code, but but if there were one, I would say don't wear that bag. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, he's like, yeah, it's just, you know, um, we, we chatted for another minute. And then he was like, yeah, just uh, one more question. Um, what do you think of Jordan Peterson? <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, what do I think of Jordan Peterson? Or he said something like, what are your feelings about Jordan Peterson? And I said, ungenerous feelings. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I still didn't know what angle he was at. He was coming from here. <laughs> and then, uh, And then I said... What would you have done if I'd come with a Jordan Peterson tote bag? <laughs> ah, dialectical reversal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like, I wouldn't have interviewed you. And I was like, okay. And then I said, D- wouldn't the Marks bag have precluded my appreciation of Jordan Peterson or vice versa? And he kind of, I, it was clear that he didn't really see them as being contradictory. I think basically he was asking me, um, are you going to be a problem, young man? Yeah. Are you an angry <laughs> young man? Uh, which, fun fact, is what I was called when I was discussing a union at the last conference <laughs> I worked at. Ah. Uh, I was, I was uh, dismissed by the management of an angry young man. No shit. Yeah. So, um, needless to say, I didn't take the job. So... Because it's like you euphemisms off. like <laughs> <laughs> Marx and Marx and Jordan Peterson aren't like ideologically the same. What does make them the same is you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Shake if it helps at all. I actually got the bag at Marx's childhood home to bring it all together. I think that does help. I think it does help. They it have a fucking they, they have, have a shot. merch store. <laughs> Oh my god, you wouldn't you wouldn't believe this place. Stop. You wouldn't believe Stop. it. It's like all the walls are painted black and and it doesn't have like any memorabilia of interest except his chair, which was very cool. I touched it. But beyond that, it's just black painted walls and some someone has like tagged basically uh you know, like timelines of his life, you know, like cool shit that Mark said. Um and then there's like a kind of exhibit to like a very like a very liberal exhibit that's like sort of hints of the dangers of Marxism. What? It's bizarre. And then there, yes, there is a gift shop in his house. Sick. <laughs> it's so <laughs> strange. <laughs> so strange. It's so strange. They couldn't resist, I guess. Yeah. I think at that level, you're you, you're just like that. The irony is necessary. You know, someone was like, "Yeah, you know what? We're also going to put a fucking gift shop in his house." I mean, what else? I mean, come on. That's crazy. That's crazy. Were the bags made there? Uh, <laughs> like a like a, a 19th century uh, factory. Like, like a <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> None of them are, are alienated from their labor. <laughs> wait, wait, let's uh, so we just do uh, official like, hello. This is Yuck and so on. Uh, we got Jake. Michael, Will, Peter. I'm Peter speaking. Um, go. Start the episode. Jake, I like your haircut. Thank you so much. I, 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 I'm having an impossible time styling it. That looks good. 
I can tell, but I just wanted to say that. Yeah, you know what? The best style is no style at all. I just didn't want that 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 haircut that makes me look like um, part of that Korean boy band. That's sort of <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the big one right now. It yeah. seems like yeah, like guys just walk into a bar when they come out and they're part of that Korean boy band. NST NFTs. What the fuck is the band called? What's the band called? BTS. BTS. Uh, BTS wait, yeah. yeah. I bought a couple NFTs with the. Uh, <laughs> I walked out with that NFT haircut. Okay. We're in it. We're talking about the end. Yeah. Because this is the last episode. What? uh, (laughs) It's always the last episode. This is not the last episode. Well, it's the only way that we can enjoy it. Oh, I see what we did there. We're always always worried about it being the last episode on Z-Shack and so on. This is true. It's a miracle that we keep going. (laughs) <laughs> or it's like every time your dad leaves for a pack of cigarettes you wonder is this it and maybe on some level the listeners think that it's like when when will they appear again because we took a prolonged break and just kind of started up as if nothing had happened um but we are dad so- well there's you know there's <laughs> hello, hello <laughs> listeners this is your father speaking <laughs> I am your what? dad. I'm to, not, to, I am the non de pair. Okay, yeah. <laughs> exactly. To tie it together, uh, in okay. less than nothing, there's it's broken down into the cigarette before and the cigarette after, and we all know what it's Brand before is. and after. So, which cigarette are we in right now? I think we're sparking up the cigarette before. You're I fucking think, right, we are. <laughs> uh, so we for this for this week we read uh, an essay from Alenka Zupacic. Uh, the end of ideology, the ideology of the end. If anyone wants to read and along. Basically, it's also an advertisement for smoking, too. This, this, uh, it this, really this made me want particular to essay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're not, we're not wrong in talking about cigarettes. The end of ideology and the ideology of the end. So just off starts, the bat, Michael, do you want yeah. to talk about, the, do you want to talk about the little, the little Slovenian reversal? Like, or what did you call it last night? Oh, like a, it's almost like a kind of palindrome that they do, isn't it? Right. The, the end of fantasy is the fantasy of the end. The end of ideology is the ideology of the end. But what if the opposite of ch- is true? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, and throw in a precisely in there and you've got it made. The only person that uses precisely more than Zizek is Alanka Zupancic, ladies and gentlemen. The end of ideology yeah. is precisely the ideology. <laughs> Wait, yeah. You got to oh, oh, you got to okay. give her credit oh, though. Precise. She's an extremely precise woman, a, and yeah. a, incredibly. And she and what's great is you want to ta- you want to get on her about using uh, precisely incorrectly, but it's always used precisely when it needs to be. <laughs> uh, okay, so what I mean this this uh, this is a humdinger. This little essay here. From where where is it from? Uh, it's it's from a collection, the South Atlantic Quarterly. How did you not know that, Jake? It's from October 2020. <laughs> Jake, so, how, do you not recognize that, how do you not recognize that from my tote bag? Under the deluge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, don't, I, I don't know I, if I miss you it remember under the deluge of New Yorkers. Yeah. I don't know if you remember reading to page 834 of the South Atlantic <laughs> Quarterly, but that's where you would have found this essay. <laughs> By the way, where on earth did you find this essay? Um, I don't know. Okay, we gotta get cracking. I'm sorry, we got we got yeah. half an hour here. Um, no, oh, only half an hour. Shit. Oh, you okay. guys can keep talking after I leave. Though. We can, okay, yeah. we're, we'll be fine. We're good. Yeah. Can't wait. We'll, we'll just we'll have the end <laughs> kind of kind of hovering over us the whole time we're doing the. Doing we're the we're so anecdotal. We're just we're just having too much fun tonight. You know? <laughs> yeah. I miss you guys. Okay, okay, okay. Well, obviously, what comes to mind when when you talk about Zizek and the end is the, the famous. Um, uh, Frederick Jameson quote, uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. That's kind of where she starts the essay. She talks about uh, how the kind of catastrophe, the natural or the the world ending, um, how it functions ideologically speaking for how we engage with the present moment. Also what comes to mind when you think of Zizek and the end is his continuous bashing of Francis Fukuyama uh, and the end of history. Mm -hmm. Right. And it kind of sets up this nice little dichotomy for, for the for the neolibs out there that the end could only ever emerge 
from the now sealed right history right mm -hmm. and ha or from outside did i say outside i hope i said outside. that history is now this sort of uh the because history is over we have this sort of um cryogenically sealed neoliberalism capitalist order that that could only ever come to an end from a disruption that were basically a god you know a, de a deus machina or, or like some sort of it couldn't emerge out of history itself it would have to come from this non-historical natural world like right yeah you know, we're currently post history living, yeah we are currently like living the end the only end to which is the end of the world exactly right, right. well yeah. put yeah, nice. exactly that's just it. and it's an it's an end that she says goes on endlessly the, the end the end of history fukuyama's end of history yeah and and and, it, and it's it's what's been called in other places you know capitalist realism uh there is no alternative there is no alternative yes that's what i was looking for well, it's a, it's a social organization without antagonism. There is no intrinsic or inherent antagonism. In fact, all antagonism has been smoothed over by George W. Bush. His, uh, uh, but then something happened the ring did not intend. History <laughs> happened again. The paradoxical reactivation of history, as she puts it. The impossible happened, right? And you like, always talks about this, the feeling that of, of a post-ideological world, you know, that... Mm. Jake, as you were saying, the contains no no more contradictions. The contradiction having been defeated, right? The outside having been conquered, and the inside being extended over the entire world. Mm -hmm. And it's telling that at that point, uh, the only, or like not the only, but the the kind of dominant, um, like Hollywood film, uh, um, genre was like you know. End of the world, like you had Armageddon, Deep Impact. I Deep think Impact both came out on the same year. Independence Day, The Core, Day After Tomorrow, that type of thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What a bunch of crap, dude. Deep Impact. <laughs> Deep Impact. I actually, for some reason, I watched that movie the other day. And God, it was bad. You know what that movie is about? It's about how journalism can save the world. <laughs> in the, Although, in the it's enough. A young Elijah Wood, uh, I think in his role directly before Frodo. Uh, emerges in all of his wide-eyed glory. The I end of the world. Also, I, 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 the I, I actually once I once uh, talked to Elijah Wood, and it was a very embarrassing experience for him. Uh, <laughs> not 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 in what he was. <laughs> what? What he, said to me. he was just hitting on a girl who was like a foot taller than him, and it was just really funny to see. In, uh, he was, in bleep? No, he was DJing a set <laughs> in Montreal. He's DJing a set in Montreal, and like I was walking by, I was like, "Holy fuck!" It's Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> He's just DJing the soundtrack from Lord of the Rings. Like, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Speaking of Lord of the Rings, it's one of those things where, like, all of the films that come out now already have within them the suggestion of a sequel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it reflects that idea, right? That the type of fantasy of the end that constitutes this order is reflected in that openness of a narrative and perpetuation of sameness right yeah and not so i was thinking about sequels but one of the things that i thought of was that um a prequel functions in a different way like rather than elaborating or continuing a narrative in its temporality a prequel kind of functions like a way of um, prolonging the ending by inhabiting a time before the end. Hmm. And that's, that's really nice. That's, that's like the function of nostalgia as such, right? Yeah. And some anxiety about what a closed narrative is like how to end something. So even um, the advent. So like historically a film starts with really long credits with cast names, directors, et cetera, then the film starts. Now the opening credits are really quick and the end is prolonged, even to the point where that's, you know, like putting in uh, footage that didn't make the cut, you know, inside gags, blah, 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 as a way of prolonging or postponing an end. That's oh, a man, really interesting point. Well, well, you know, I was watching uh, The 39 Steps 
recently, Hitchcock movie. And the beginning of the movie is basically half of the movie, right? Getting back to, I mean, it's interesting, right? So in this, in this end of history context, you know, this kind of stagnation of a certain moment of the, of the, of the Western democratic neoliberal order, you have, yes, 9-11, yes, Bush, but most recently, as Alenka points out, you got Donald Trump. As she points out, Donald Trump was actually like the figure of you. We can see we can see now is is one of the figures of the end of, of the end of history era, right? That he doesn't or like what what does she say here? That he was almost in, like like received as one of those um, world ending disasters, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Because he he was fashioned as a political outsider, mm-hmm. so obviously by no means an outsider in terms of finance, social currency, celebrity status, all of that shit, but definitely fashioned himself as some type of disruptor draining the swamp. But like, but, but the irony. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. um, The irony of Trump's make America great again, as some sort of figure from the outside is that the Democrats themselves got caught up in him as a signifier, essentially, like their concern is a fantasy about a return to pre-Trump conditions. So right. they right. have a fantasy right. of making America great again through removing Trump. The, the, um, no longer do the no longer do the contradictions of American society remain. It's it's just the antag- the antagonistic figure of Trump, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course perfect. he was one, right? But like. She, Alenka, Alenka says that uh, Zimpancha says, should I say Alenka? I like saying Alenka. It feels, it feels nice. I like Alenka. Uh, Fabio Alenka. <laughs> <laughs> We're on a first name basis with these guys. <laughs> we are. Slavoj. Slavoj. Bod, Frank. Come on. For, for this devastation and these contradictions that got Trump elected in the first place and very much from within the end of history and the end of ideology. Trump is part of the picture, right? And then continuing, uh, uh, I'll just quote her here. She writes, like, you know, follows are proposed to look into the two modalities of the relationship between repetition or repetitive perpetuation, continuation of the same, and ending, and the fantasies that structure this relationship. So where she starts is uh, kind of teasing out this notion of the end as a repetition. I think we've been talking about this, where um, the end of history was a kind of perpetual ending. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the I feel like the what, what, one way of formulating it I came I figured was like the the false dichotomy between possibility and potential and actuality and reality is is the ideological gap that functions between these two in this dichotomy is actually the hegemonic order right mm-hmm. it's it's a sort of oh, yeah. always sustained in this notion mm-hmm. that the thing is to come you know the 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 end is to come and and I think that 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 gap that what, what, what it facilitates is the uh, ideological smooth functioning of mm-hmm. things never changing, right? Yeah. Things never, so so never what made. I think like one way she problematizes that is by thinking about what possibility is and how possibility in a sense kind of stands in the way of itself or in the way of a thinking outside of, of the bounds installed by the end, by the end of history. Yeah. Because if you right. can always, if you can always end, if you want, if, if the possibility of ending something remains, it allows you not to do anything about it. So, like if the exactly. possibility of doing something about your living situation under capitalism continues, then it allows you to continue as of, you know, as you normally would. And and she has the great example of Monty Python in the uh, "Every Sperm Is Sacred" segment of uh, uh, what movie was that? Meaning of Life. Meaning of Life. Yeah, that's right. So, like the conclusion for the Protestants is that if they acted on the possibility that they would have been really free, Mm -hmm. if they'd acted on the possibility, but the problem isn't that they don't act. Mm -hmm. They would have already been caught up in that logic of freedom as a realization of possibilities, which, you know, never because the free freedom is possibility. uh, Acting on that is against the logic of possibility because it's, it's always remains. Exactly. This has a lot to do with uh, 
she references Frank Gruner's book, uh, Abolishing Freedom, right? And, and, and the problem for both of them is that if it's not that you don't act, the problem is not non-action, but the problem is that our action is always related to this formal freedom or presupposing this formal freedom in its form as possibility, right? And so the tragedy here is that freedom is, is as possibility is always already freedom, right? It's sufficient. It's in and of itself freedom. It's totologically freedom. And in this way, adds nothing to the very reality of our freedom, which is actually accepting a limit, accepting uh-huh. an end, yeah. accepting so the like fact that- a truer freedom. So freedom of choice, for instance, the American <laughs> kind of like model yeah. of freedom. Yeah. And no, the, no, the, the I, I was actually going to say, con- oh yeah, yeah. But that's but, the one like, that we critique. Talk- yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. Well, this is, the diff- the, it's excellent. She says it like right at the beginning and then never fucking picks it up again. But she says the two modalities that she's going to discuss of the end and our relationship to it um, she says one ha- one is on an objective and one is on a subjective level. Mm-hmm. On a, a subject and objective level, uh, uh, she says subjective and objective economies mm-hmm. of our relationship to the end. And I think that that's really interesting because Peter, what you just mentioned is sort of the objective, passive relationship to freedom. And then I think that we have this in this ult- ultima cigaretta conversation, yeah. in the last cigarette. We have a sort of more subjective relationship to to the end in 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 terms of how we structure and fantasize our enjoyment and let's, that to me is let's, let's go down there that. so so first so just to sum up that first segment it's like repetition as possibility of an end that is never arrived at the end as possibility to which and then the next stage is repeating an end uh which one is certain is an end and and she uses the story of xeno anyone want to hazard a i brought i brought the book to the book club today oh nice <laughs> very cool did you draw on that no, no, that's the or cover. Or is that the, that's the cover? Yeah. Very cool. Wow. Is it by again? Italo Svivo. Italo Svivo. Nicely done. That's his pen name, though. As she says, I didn't know that it was a pen name. So the first chapter in the book is called Smoke. Uh, and it's about the main character, his obsession with smoking. But more importantly, his obsession with quitting smoking. Which has a more problem than the smoking itself. Right. Yeah. So we can see that, that smoking functions in a similar way to what we we're just talking about in, in, the, in the realm of the possibility of, of attaining something in terms of your relation to it. I'm free to quit smoking whenever I want. And because I'm free to do that, I don't quit smoking. Right. And prolong the ending of it. Yeah, that's it, right? Uh, Zizek says that um, the possibility which it's not enough to say it obfuscates or masks or prevents the possibility of change. It is the condition for things to remain the same. Right. Yeah. So the fantasy is if you take away that um, the obstacle in the way that things will actually change, but it's that similar to that mechanism that he uses about um, two people going for the same job and one guy getting the job. And you have to put up this um, facade of, oh, if I would have got the job, I would have given it to you, right? (laughs) The idea is like it's an offer that's meant to be refused. So a possibility functions in a similar way that a possibility can be evoked, although we all know or expect it won't be used. So you're free to choose on the condition that you make the right choice. But it's if freedom only exists as a virtual possibility then you're stuck in this um cycle of postponement mm-hmm. and then That's and then okay, wait, just... michael i want to actually just tag on with yeah, that Peter, ahead, sorry. Yeah. um <clears throat> but that, well, what's interesting is that i i know that we're sneaking into a little conversation here about about the the, the difference between truth and illusion for zizek and how we should we want a third way we want a third pill is that there's not a dichotomy between truth and illusion truth is only ever founded or structured by our fa- fantastical illusion so the only way that we can actually make the choice and actually be free is to have it structured by this illusion of po- of possibility rather so it's not that we we don't want to quit it's that the possibility of quitting is what supports us not quitting right or it's like it's not that we don't want you know it's not that we don't want the job it's just that the fact that we could have given it to the other guy allows us to sort of embody and take up that choice more freely right yeah, that does that I, make does I that make sense? That's, yeah, yeah and there's, and like that's accompanied. Go ahead. It's ideology. It's ideology. 
Well, that's, and I, I think that's accompanied by, you know, the, the continual refrain of like, this is my last cigarette, right? You Like the certainty that this is my last cigarette. She writes, you want to stop, you do everything in your power to stop, but you end up accumulating one last cigarette after another. That is, you end up infinitely repeating the end and enjoying it against your will, which is of course, a very precise definition of neurotic enjoyment. One thing's break up sex, which by the way, as a category, I can say I've never had. You know, where you're like, we're done, but let's have one more go at it. You know, it's like, I, who? I can't imagine that. I mean, I've certainly had you. For me, I've just never ended a relationship. I, I've just, I'm in all of the relationships I've always <laughs> been in. They're all continuing. They're, you're just I'm party in well. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I'm still in a relationship with my high school girl. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> we, we, we talk all the time. Every, all my girlfriends. We, so I've never had breakup sex because I've never broken up. Um, but I've been. <laughs> Well, what about um, if any of you are listening you know shut shut out i'll talk to you soon um, um <laughs> i wanted to put in a t- tiny little anecdote here sorry i know i know we're, we're sort of watching the clock but i had i once worked with a guy named paul and paul had quit cigarettes and paul told me the way he quit cigarettes is the exact reversal of this he said every time he wanted a cigarette he'd say i'll just have the next one and then he'd, he'd want a cigarette again and he'd go i'll just have the next one he said he did that for what felt like years. He just say, "I'll have the next one, not this one. You'll have the next one." And he never smoked again. Wow! So he's always going to have the next cigarette. And I was like, "That is amazing because it's the that exact reversal." Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the exact reversal. Not this one. Have the next one. The opposite is true. So it's well, he's, the opposite. he's enjoying precisely. He's... What do you but... think of the um, like this modality of the as if? You know, like, so you have to, you act as if this is your last cigarette. There's something about it that, um, like, I know this isn't charitable, but like, it, it's reminiscent of CBT, like a cognitive behavioral approach. So like, how does something like, so if you position yourself in such a way where it's, you retroactively act as if the cigarette you just finished is the last one. Zapanchish has this, um, what would you call it, like trepidation about Ruder's formulation because there's a difference between acting as if and then like genuinely believing. Yeah. I, I think something, for, for, that for that to be functioning, believe it. For, that, for that to be functioning in the realm of quitting smoking, you would honestly have to believe at the end of every single cigarette that this is the last cigarette, which seems impossible, right? That doesn't seem like anyone would relate with on that scale. No. I, and there's like I have, three left in the pack, you, I get anxiety. Well, it's like, but I mean, I've that's also, also had my last ideology. Cigarette. It's like, you know very well that this is your last exactly, cigarette. Exactly, Peter. Yeah. You know very well, but you act differently. And that, that yeah. to me is how we structure our, the, the unconscious enjoy you know that's the economy of the unconscious right of, of enjoyment we have to have our we have These to have deals. this fantastical this exactly this little illusion or fantastical relation that a, a relationship that's structured and it structures our enjoyment because we can't have that kind of immediate relationship with the real right there needs to be this kind of pathological enjoyment where it's not about the smoking at all it's not about the content at all it's about the form right why why is Zeno obsessed with quitting it's, it, it's the pathological situation of Julie Sons, right? It's not the content, but the excess of the limit of, of the content, right? So mm-hmm. for me, it come, always comes back to, you know, the dream content and the dream form, right? It's not what happens in the dream. It's why the content itself takes the dream form. Why would we have to unconsciously structure this relationship to enjoyment? Because it's just too much, right? It's, it's excessive. We couldn't possibly exist an immediate relationship to it. So we have to invent this kind of fantasy, the illusion. You know, right? he, finally, the, he finally settles in the notion that, that the, the ending is a source of enjoyment for him. And that's where he, he, at the end of the book, he says like, I finally taken up quitting cigarettes again. Well, we've actually yeah. skipped, a, we yeah, skipped we the skipped, point. We skipped some we good skipped stuff. The part where, well, no, we, oh yeah, sorry. Well, but, but we skipped, we definitely skipped where, the, where the, the, the psychoanalyst says, you're free to smoke. Right, he sort of releases him from the non de pair, right? He releases him from, from this the super egoic injunction to quit, and then he's he, he's right, and then he, he no longer it enjoys. Doesn't work. I think it doesn't, doesn't work. work. Yeah, yeah, he's not free. In fact, he's been he's been told that he's free to do the thing, which is to smoke, 
but he feels more oppressed by this, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, so like he, impo- he imposes on Zeno the absolute freedom to smoke. So it means that Zeno is without an end on the horizon. Like he can either endlessly repeat or else approach in a kind of infinite movement an end that he can that allows him to manage his enjoyment or regulate it in one way or another. But maybe the problem was that, exactly. as Jake was saying with the dream form, it wasn't really exactly about smoking. No, exactly. Right. It was about his relationship with his father. As you say, like, I finally succeeded in returning to my sweet habits and started to quit smoking again. I I love that. It's so good. Yeah, it's really good. This definition of enjoying one's symptom, right? Yeah, perfect. I thought it was a beautiful way of putting it. Once you 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 really enjoy it, it was like, oh! (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. It's like, it's, it's... I know it's like if if they were savvy, like th- there'd be a hashtag there, you know. I'd be like, oh, wow, yeah, <laughs> your symptom. There it is. Um, it's like it's like when when the artist of you know when an art like a musical artist says their own name or something in a song, you know. Bolin, like uh, T Rex, with Bolin likes to rock <laughs> now. Yes, he does. Um, what's 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 wild is just to think about this. <clears throat> Absolute freedom of, sm- of smoking. Everyone knows this chain, a chain smoker, right? You've probably worked with a dishwasher at restaurants who smokes without enjoyment. They're just, you're like, all they do is smoke. And they're obviously not enjoying smoking. They're, they're smoking but, is... Because the they're free they, to fucking smoke. They just well, don't care. The, the reason they're smoking <laughs> is to not work, right? So like, the only way, <laughs> the only way they get a break. <laughs> which is sad, which is sad because, you know, but Jake, the, no, the, the, cigarette, that, the like... cigarette is the vacation of the proletariat. Let's put it that way, right? They can't <laughs> afford, sure, they sure. can't afford to go to an island, but they can afford to buy cigarettes. Although not here, but, but, to, not here. but Jake, like you were just saying, you know, Zeno says the freedom to smoke whenever I liked finally depressed me totally. And it's this, it's this like malaise of it's like the doldrums of freedom you know a freedom Mm -hmm. without perturbation perturbation without limitation this total expanse i think that there's something interesting is it's like can you have a relationship with like they just don't have a relationship with the real through smoking right like right like only when there's a limit imposed can the economy of jouissance manage enjoyment in a certain way and take hold and be situated right the possibility of the injunction to quit is the excess of the action it's the very thing that is enjoyed, right? It's not the, I mean, of course, there's some <laughs> yeah, yeah, pleasurable yeah. things about smoking, but really what, we're, what we are enjoying is the unconscious, you know, sort of deferral of the limit, right? The, un, the, the sort of, we are always structuring our relationship to enjoyment and it's not enjoyment itself that we're having because you can't just embody enjoyment. Mm-hmm. It's what we enjoy is our, our, the gap. The relate the yeah. just very structuring of the relationship. It's like you know, well, to, mm. to the reference, love a good quit. It's like Zeno's paradox, right? The arrow, love quitting, getting <laughs> near its target but never actually arriving at it. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of Kramer when he has the smoking room, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's, fucking, he's like aged 40 years and fucking 72 <laughs> hours yeah. yeah yeah it's too much man it's too much in fact kramer was real <laughs> kramer is a, a, an excrement of the real absolutely yeah <laughs> and then she kind of brings it in as like the end can can function as perhaps a liberatory moment i think zizek speaks about the same you know in the same way as like uh there is potential in the end like the end isn't enclosed and certain because there's always a kind of um openness about the situation the catastrophe has already happened it's already occurred right it's not that there is there is a looming catastrophe about which we can do nothing except wait which is the feeling now, right? The feeling of, of the coming ecological collapse or the collapse of our medical system or insert whatever calamity, whatever four horse, whatever horsemen of the apocalypse. But I mean, I'm feeling, I'm jumping to the end here, but she says the world will surely end, but that won't necessarily be the end of our troubles, which I think is a, a very valuable thing to hear in, the, in, that, in that feeling of stagnation, right? Of of possible of the endless possibilities, but it instant there is a kind of limit imposed there, right? But a limit like 
the the end as annihilation, the end the end as the end of the world doesn't yeah. really involve us, you know, because there's no subject to experience it. Right. Whereas, I'm yeah, projecting an end that has happened, you know, the, like we we are like if we admit that we are fucked, then that kind of liberates you in a certain way. In yeah, certain, right. There isn't yeah. an imposing you're about to be fucked. <clears throat> Absolutely. And this is this is that this reminded me of the conversation we had with Hegel and Wired Brain, where we have the, you know, the post-capitalist assumption by capitalists is that this of singularity, right? This kind of a subjective unified unification, un, like universal plugging in that would sort of like finally do away with the ugliness that brought about this scenario in the first place, right? The apocalyptic scenario in the first place, which is the human is the human aspect. But but lurking behind this whole conversation is, you know, what does Zizek, is, is Zizek what is Zeno actually repeating, right? He's he's not repeating his enjo- what he enjoys. He's repeating his very failure to attain enjoyment right and this reminds me of what actually to traverse the fantasy right is to learn that there is no big other there's no such thing as the big other and then to reassume the big other and i feel like that's exactly what we've talked what, what you've been talking about here it's like in order to like, yeah like like our ther- our analyst sort of releases us from the from the from the the constraints of the big other only for us to avoid a psych- psychotic breakdown and reassume the big other. So once you learn that there is no big other, you have to reassume the big other, right? And your relationship to it. And I think that that's what we're talking about, Will, is, is like being is this, is assuming that the end has already happened is the same thing as reassuming the big other, right? It's and, like, it, it, and it's also it's also the same thing as recognizing that that our being and the, and the political social order is contradictory, right? Like, and I think that's what enjoying one's symptom includes or, or, and, or and mutable. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, mutable. Yeah. Right. Like, like the whole point is like, once you realize that the, like, what do, what do I, I want to make sure that I'm not just like hiding behind jargon here. It's like when, when you realize that there is no big other, like, it's like that there is no given, right. That, that the structure of reality is not in fact given in the way that it seems to be. And that you can relate to it in a different way. And I don't mean in a kind of a Buddhist, like it's just about perspective, but that different signifiers can in fact emerge. The feeling of there, there is no alternative, however you want to describe it, the end of history is necessarily like we're coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Like this feeling that there, there is only p- the perpetual sameness. There is only the non-contradictory order, which I not being duped uh can see i think it comes I, 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 we've seen and we've seen the like if you were up, you know subscribed to that understanding the last 20 30 years are, are a continual lesson in how wrong that was yeah 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 the end of history lasted for like for like you know 15 years and then oops <laughs> it wasn't a very good end of history we need the we need the sequel maybe well, it's that the whole the whole point was that the history never, in fact, did end, right? <laughs> it was this false it was this false ideological notion of an inside outside, which is funny because what I like about about her beginning this essay with Fukuyama is that, in a way, she situates the ideolo- the, the ideology as both spatial and temporal. Like, yeah. the end of history is is both this thing that is, you know, the end will come from the outside, and also the time. It is in a certain way now just bracketed off, right? We've entered this post, it's atemporal, right? The post ideological situation is atemporal. So, how does that um, wait? Pause. pause. Sorry, I'm sorry, I have to leave now. Um, well, good luck, eh? Fuck them, bring your marks back. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and definitely bring the marks back, <laughs> and maybe put a New Yorker bag in your pocket if you really want a job, and, and grab the so 39 Steps older. to Life by Jordan Peterson. And you're <laughs> <on> <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when you when he mentioned thirty nine steps earlier, I was like, "Isn't that, isn't that the Jordan Peterson book? How steps are for Jordan Peterson?" Ah, uh, no 12? shit. Yeah, steps? yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it's only twelve, dude. All right, well, where his seat? Where's his sequel? There's got to be at least he, another. He did, what's actually, the map? He did. Do, he did do an, a sequel. Another. Yeah, there. Don't worry. There'll be thirty nine steps soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had already made that slip in my mind earlier and was like, I shouldn't, don't say it. Cause that's definitely not how many steps Jordan Peterson came up with, but, but then I was confident, you know, it's gotta be, you know?
how do you think existing in the end of history in that experience that we're just talking about uh, is different than what she's saying about about living as if the the catastrophe already happened? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's a tricky one. It is yeah. because the first one is almost the zombie state, the, the you know the repetition of it's not a perpetual like repeating of the end necessarily, just living in that unending end. Uh, whereas in the kind of Frank Ruda or Zupanchich framework, uh, she writes, it is perhaps at this very precise point, precise point, uh, <laughs> the point where very much like Zeno, we are anticipating a catastrophe which will sweep over our trouble, or sweep all of our troubles away and reset the world. That should fully apply to Ruda's principle or formula and say, but wait, it's already happened at least once. We don't need to pretend or act as if it's already happened. Maybe that's the difference. Or is she saying, is that a critique of Ruda? I read it as a critique of Ruda. Okay, yeah, it is. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, so she's, so in talking, so with Zeno himself, right, like the, the way that he actually only kind of, like, he realizes he had the only cure is, is the end of the world, right? The destruction. Hello, Kitty. Um, I didn't know you had a cat. Yeah, I got a little. His name's Pig. That's oh, God, that's good. Wait, is that Tess? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, okay. Okay. Well, I, okay. I don't know, Peter. You 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 bring up a good point and a point that I don't think like I actually have hard a hard time a hard time formulating is this. Well, and I, I tried to make it about, not make it about, but I tried to better understand it through traversing the fantasy, right? It's assuming that the end has already happened in a certain way. To me, that made most sense. But now trying to think about it in the valence of a critique of Ruda, Michael, can you even, or even Peter, maybe it was you, Peter, but but can neither of you kind of tease that out for me? Why this sort of electing the end of the world as the only cure, right? Uh, well, but I, I think maybe... Zizek's notion of the courage of hopelessness might be instructive here, right? Because it's only by acknowledging that we are fucked by the train, you know, the, the oncoming light through the tunnel is an, is a train that we can thoroughly analyze the situation. So yeah. Is the radical end extinction perhaps too optimistic? Mm -hmm. What of the possibility, yeah. which would be freedom for a difference, right? Freedom for an because alternative. Our, yeah, because our problems are not exactly the end of the world. Our problems are what to do with, within our situation, uh, how to restructure, reframe it. Because, I mean, climate change, for example, is not a single cataclysmic end where the world just explodes, right? It's yeah. A, it's a continuing catastrophe in which we are currently immersed, which... which um, requires a perpetual acknowledgement that yes, we are fucked, but given that we are, we are called upon to act in the moment. Which right. And we only, and we don't give it the event. That, yeah. Yeah. It's that, it's that the, 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 the possibility of the, of the end as we've sort of structured it fantastically is not enough to guarantee that we actually go about um, formulating an alternative, right? The, the idea or the possibility that things can be different means that we defer making them different. And that's the very logic of, cap of, of, of the sort of late capitalist, right? Is the things can be different. So we don't have to do anything about making them different, you know? Yeah, that's right. Like, so <laughs> the difference you know, is coming. Get, don't worry. The difference told. is coming. <laughs> <laughs> through AI and climate change, different the difference is coming. You know, we don't have to actually politically bring about that difference, right? Yeah. Well, if we say we say if we were to do something about singularity, the oncoming neural link fucking Elon Musk screw us all out of being human type thing, we would have to like kind of acknowledge that we already are fucked because if we didn't do anything, it would be that way. So what we what is required is in action now is to assume that we are fucked and then continue to act. And isn't it ironic that one of the promoted features of Neuralink is ostensibly to relive experiences? Like, wasn't his douchey thing that you can share your fuck scene with a friend? I didn't know that. Yeah, you could, yeah. 
Oh, that's so, he's such a bro. It's insane. Like you can like have sex with someone and then go show that to your pals is what he's saying. It just shows that there's no, it shows that there's no ability to produce a positive vision of what that subjectivity would entail. Uh So it has to be sold. Yeah. Guy who's definitely had sex before wants to show friends. (laughs) (laughs) So, but but this is really, cur- but this is curious because it's not to assume, assuming that one is, the end has already happened, that you already fucked, is not a realism, right? It's not a, things cannot be different, mm-hmm. correct? I'm because sorry, there is a question mark there. I'm like. Because, because, I mean, either way, you are still acting within the moment. There is the present as it exists, right? And like, you could act, I mean, either way, you are acting and you can either uh, do something about it with the admission that you are, fu- or with like with the understanding that you're fucked or you can say that you're fucked and not do anything about it, I guess. Hmm. Well, in, important here, Pete, is the um, pathological, pathologically jealous husband part, right? Like the formulation being uh, the, the fact that there are real causes of concern in no way contradicts the phantasmatic character of the representations of the end. Exactly. And then the fact that a jealous husband claims about his wife that she fucks other people are real in no way contradicts the phantasmatic character that sustains his pathology. Mm -hmm. The very fact of the end sustains our non, our our pathological relationship to it. Right. Which is, which is one of deferral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even when we're told like, you know, you've got four years left for carbon levels to be capped or reduced or whatever to be brought within some mode of limitation, Speaking of enjoyment, it can it continues to function as a way to uh, mm. put off an end to action. So there's it's not a real goal, but a postponement that uh, like ensures that nothing actually changes. So it's yeah. pathological uh, in the way that we can relate to change, but it's also a a virtual point of catastrophe, right? Like it has a symbolic efficiency as a carbon number itself. So it perpetuates pseudo activities like recycling, Jake. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's perpetuated in that mode of repetition. So like, yeah. So what but we're repeating is our failure to enjoy, right? Is like that. So to me, the, econ- the economy of enjoyment, the unconscious thing here, the unconscious economy is that perhaps what we need to do is begin with enjoyment because or politics of enjoyment, because what it seems like we enjoy most is the deferral of the end is that we know very well that the end is coming, but we assume as if, we, you know, every year the the UN p- publishes that paper, being like, "Well, we're way fucking worse than we were last year." <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And and it's like, but but that doesn't. But what we obviously enjoy is not acting, right? We enjoy the assumption of the end as opposed to acting as if it's already happened. The continual leftist refrain of like just going on, like the like uh, the sense of critique and of of um, can, you know continually proclaiming that that we're already fucked remember like alonka says why does zeno repeat and it's he's not repeating his enjoyment he's repeating his failure to enjoy right Mm -hmm. to attain and this is so the unconscious to me is uh, is 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 obsessional it's essentially obsessional we need to have this sort of obsessive relationship with not attaining enjoyment And, and that's what we enjoy and i think in this case we we are passively enjoying the end, right? As opposed to recognizing it as such, right? We passively enjoy this like this obsessional relationship with the end instead of sort of bringing it about, right? Instead of like actually, oh, committing. I, we're, no, we're, no, we're active in our postponement though, right? Like we're active in our postponement. It's not just that we passively enjoy the end, but our engagement with the end takes the form of postponement Mm -hmm. enjoyment in postponement so it's enjoyment enjoyment is structured by a limitation and i and that's great and i am i'm mindful of the need to end this episode um we have been running pretty long uh so um i think that's a good place to leave it any any other thoughts fellas uh i've got a nice mark twain quote for you oh please well, Mark Twain or W.C. Fields or maybe Oscar Wilde, like it's one of those guys, uh, 
To see smoking is the easiest thing I ever did. I ought to know because I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> or it's the, That's it's, the Mitch, it's the Mitch Hedberg, you know, it's, it's the, I, I, I used to do drugs. Uh, I still do drugs, but I used to too. <laughs> That's right. Nice. Right. I was like, it's a frozen banana. I was like, I hope it's one of them. But yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, thanks for everyone. Everyone for listening. Uh, we got a Patreon. I know no one listens to the end of an episode, but uh, we'll plug it anyway. Uh, you got to smoke. Go ahead and light it. <laughs> smoke them <laughs> if you got them. Smoke them if you got them. <laughs> Bye, guys. Okay. Yeah, Michael, there's this, there's this <laughs> joke. Exactly, Michael. There's this joke where I, I, fucking, we, I actually used to end with the end. <laughs> Jake, like, Jake mistakes the end of the episode for the end of when we're talking to each other. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> bye, guys. <laughs> bye, guys. And I just fucking sign off and they'd be like, dude, no, obviously we, have, we need to talk. He about doesn't it. get he doesn't get that the end of the is purely performative. <laughs> until until the episode is made, we're retroactively <laughs> pause, like projecting. No, sorry. We're projecting the end which is to come well but, but can i say that because there's something very uncomfortable about faking the end there is i'm telling you no this is why then, you never do it i always I, do no it. i can't do it where it's like okay <laughs> bye guys and then i'm still looking at you and the mic's still on it's like i need like, that you got your hand on the end button i i touched like i i always go to the fucking sign up you're going for it i saw yeah you. <laughs> yeah i just but i need to do that i need to perform that for myself because it's like okay bye guys yeah i have a, like this is you talk. You know, I'm I'm like I'm <laughs> <laughs>